substitution reactions of alcohols. And you're going to find out that a hydroxyl group is not a good leaving group. But in this lesson, we're going to explore a few different ways to turn it into either a halogen, chloride, bromide, iodide, which are good leaving groups, or into what's called a sulfonate ester, which is also a good leaving group. Now, this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so first example here, we said we can replace the hydroxyl group with a halogen like chloride bromide iodide. And we'll start with that by simply just adding a very strong acid like HCl, HBr, or HI. And I'll start with HBr here. And we see we turn this tertiary alcohol into a tertiary bromide. Cool, and the way this works is, once again, that OH is not a good leaving group. You might recall that your good leaving groups are typically chloride bromide iodide. And you might also remember that the hallmark of what made them a good leaving group is they're really stable after they leave. And evidence of that, you might think, is that it's a really weak base after it leaves. And so if, you know, bromide were to leave, well, Br- minus is the conjugate base of HBr. And if HBr is a really strong acid, then Br- minus is a really ridiculously weak base and therefore a good leaving group. Problem is, if we want to envision a hydroxyl group leaving in a reaction, um, it would turn into hydroxide, which is a strong base and therefore not a good leaving group whatsoever. And so in this case, the way this reaction actually happens is we need to use a strong acid like HBr because the first step is going to protonate that hydroxyl group. So, and this has to be in strong acid. So it turns out a hydroxyl group is not going to get protonated like it, you know, pH 7 or something like that. It has to be only under strongly acidic conditions. And that's what's going to happen here. And so... All right. So all of a sudden now, instead of a hydroxyl group, we've got water sitting right here. And water is a good leaving group because water is a weak base. And so the problem is that, you know, you can only do this under highly acidic conditions. And so, you know, a lot of the reactions where we'd want to have a good leaving group are things like SN2, which needs a strong nucleophile. The problem is that most strong nucleophiles are also strong bases. And so you couldn't be like, add acid and then add the strong nucleophile with it at the same time, because they couldn't coexist. And so this is not something you can like just blanketly do. Add strong acid so that you can turn it into a good leaving group, then you can do anything you want. We're really limited on the strong nucleophiles that can exist in this solution. And one of them that can exist is the one that's present in this solution, like bromide. So chloride, bromide, iodide, they're all strong nucleophiles as well as good leaving groups. So, but as free ions, they're strong nucleophiles and they just happen to be present at the same time this guy is. Now, in this case, this is tertiary, so we can't do backside attack or anything like that. So, but we're in a highly protic solution and so a carbocation can form. And the evidence that we're in a highly protic solution is that I haven't listed any solvent or anything, but you know, usually protic meant like water or an alcohol or something like that. But in this case, we have a strong acid. That's so far beyond protic, it's not funny. This solution's not like just protic, it's like super protic. It's the way I like to think about it. And so we can definitely form a carbocation here. And forming a carbocation, if there's a favorable rearrangement, that would be something we'd have to examine. Not the case here. We've got this lovely tertiary carbocation. And that's where bromide's going to come and attack. So, and that takes us to our final product here. And so in this case, this is totally SN1. So formed a carbocation under these super protic conditions and life is good. And so this is really nice for tertiary and secondary uh, alcohols being that that's what is affected for SN1. But notice primary doesn't usually work for SN1, which is why we have a problem here. So because if we add HBr to a primary alcohol, it works and we still get replacement of the hydroxyl group with bromide. And so we gotta feel like, well, then what in the world's going on there? Well, what's going on here? First step is exactly the same here. So we're just going to protonate our alcohol. So in this case now, our hydroxyl group, which is a bad leaving group, is now water, which is a good leaving group, 
but it just can't leave because it would form a primary carbocation. We learned earlier that primary carbocations are not stable enough to typically form. So in this case, how's this reaction happening? So, well, in this case, it turns out for a primary or methyl halide, if you happen, or methyl alcohol, if you happen to have one, so it actually proceeds by an SN2 reaction as revealed by kinetic studies. And so all of a sudden now we're doing backside attack and replacing that water now with bromide. And now it goes by SN2. And this is tricky because now we gotta like, be like, well, what's the mechanism for HBr with an alcohol? Well, it depends on which alcohol you have. If you've got a tertiary or secondary alcohol, which can form a carbocation, it's gonna go by SN1. That's preferred under these super protic conditions. However, if it's a primary alcohol or you have methanol, then it actually goes by SN2 since a carbocation can't form. So that's kind of the deal here. You gotta know that it's one or two of two mechanisms depending on what kind of alcohol you have. Now, one other thing to note here, if instead of uh, uh, HBr, if we use HI, no difference. But if we use HCl, so it turns out with HCl, we don't get a good yield unless we add a little bit of zinc chloride with it. And the idea is that now we're gonna have some zinc two plus in our solution. And zinc two plus, very electropositive. So your alcohol will actually attack that. And so instead of turning into water, You get this lovely species here, but you still have oxygen with a positive formal charge here, and that's still a good leaving group. And so now your chloride from HCl, in this case being primary, could come in and do backside attack on this carbon. And so instead of a leaving group that's water, you have a leaving group that's in a complex with zinc, but still works replacing ultimately your OH with a chloride. So just wanted you to see how the mechanism is just a little bit different when we have to add that zinc catalyst in the presence of HCl. So for HBr and HI, no catalyst needed. But for HCl, not quite as strong of an acid, we do need that zinc catalyst to get a good yield. All right, the next substitution reaction we'll look at is still gonna be replacing the hydroxy group with a bromide specifically. So, but instead of using HBr, which may involve a carbocation, so we're gonna use PBR3 with pyridine here, and here's PBR3 and here's pyridine, and I've kind of draw them out here so we can show the mechanism. So gonna be a little bit different here. And so in this case, hydrox group's gonna come and attach to phosphorus at the same time that one of these bromides is going to break away. All right, leaves us with this lovely species right here. And uh, in this case, the uh, pyridine here is just there to act as a base. And he's just there to come and deprotonate this hydrogen to keep this from going back and being reversible here. So we'll come and do that. We'll deprotonate. Cool, and that takes us right here. So, and it turns out that even though an OH is a bad leaving group, your oxygen that's bonded to this phosphorus is a good leaving group. So I'm gonna highlight that here. This species right here is your good leaving group now. So OH bad leaving group, but this thing's actually good enough to leave. And in this case, you can kind of take a look, and if you had to predict the mechanism by which it leaves, by which this substitution's carried out, well, in this case, it goes, uh, the substitution results in Walden inversion, and so you might lead that to conclude that, oh, it must go by SN2, and you would be correct. It's gonna go by SN2. Now, one thing we didn't show, this other bromide ion that broke off from phosphorus when we did nucleophilic attack here, it's what's actually going to do the backside attack, and so it's gonna come in do backside attack, kick off this good leaving group we had here. And again, because it's doing this by SN2, we just get the inverted bromide here. And then obviously we're gonna get that species right there as our leaving group. 
But cool, net result here though is that we've just got the corresponding alkyl bromide with inverted stereochemistry, but important here is because this does go by SN2, it doesn't work for all alcohols. So for SN2 to be possible, you gotta be methyl, primary, secondary, this does not work for tertiary alcohols. So if your goal is to turn a tertiary alcohol into the corresponding alkyl bromide, you should use HBr. So, but if your goal is to make it work for a methyl, uh, methanol, I guess, or a primary or secondary alcohol, this will work. And again, it proceeds with inversion of configuration. All right, the next substitution reaction here is, uh, again, a substitution of the hydroxyl group with a chlorine, alternative way to pull this off, using what's called thionyl chloride, SOCl2, in the presence of pyridine. And this, in some ways, is gonna be very similar to what we saw with PBr3, uh, but using a sulfur reagent instead. Now, truth is, this actually is way more complicated than I'm gonna present it. So, turns out, if you do the reaction with or without pyridine, you get a different mechanism. You'll get some books even simplify this further than this, uh, what I'll present to you, and simplify the mechanism and stuff, but uh, this is why what I'm going to show, I will tell you though, that if we don't use pyridine, this may go through an alternate mechanism called the SNI mechanism. Uh, and there are some professors that do cover that. If that is the case, you actually find out that this reaction would proceed with retained configuration. Our wedged OH would lead to a wedged chlorine. So, but the one I'm going to show here with the presence of pyridine is going to go through an SN2 mechanism. And the truth is I'm actually even oversimplifying it here. The mechanism is way more complex than I'm even going to show. So, but this is the common present mechanism you'll see in most textbooks. So, and this would be very reminiscent of what you saw with PBR3. So we're going to come and attack sulfur, causing one of these chlorines to leaf. All right, taking us there, and just like we did with PBr3, the pyridine is there to deprotonate that hydrogen. And it turns out in the real mechanism, it might be there to do a little bit more than that. But this is how I'm going to show it. Like I said, because that's how it's commonly presented in many textbooks. All right, so that takes us here. So, and then this chloride that broke off back here is gonna what's, be what's doing backside attack. And once again, just like with PBr3, uh, OH is not a good leaving group, but this oxygen bond of this sulfur complex here is a good leaving group. That's gonna be our leaving group. The chloride here is gonna come and do backside attack, causing our leaving group to leave. And this does go by SN2, leading to inversion of configuration. Now, if you'd like to see a little more about the mechanism here for thionyl chloride, including the SNI mechanism when there's no pyridine present, uh, you can check out in my free course on chadsprep.com. Uh, in addition to the video, I also include a brief article kind of outlining the commonly presented mechanisms and then that SNI mechanism, which is seldom presented, but some of you might be on the hook for. All right, the last substitution reaction for alcohols we'll look at is turning a hydroxyl group into what's called a sulfonate ester, and this is specifically a toluene sulfonate ester. Uh, not the only example, but the one I'm going to cover here. And in this case, the reagent's called tosyl chloride, and it's in pyridine, and pyridine's going to serve a similar role to what we saw with PBr3 and SOCl2. Uh, and in this case, so you're almost always going to see this abbreviated. So it turns out that toluene sulfonyl chloride here looks like this. And it's this part of the molecule that we abbreviate TS here. So toluene is a methyl benzene. So that's called toluene. And then the sulfonyl group or sulfonate or it's a derivative of sulfonic acid. So this is toluene sulfonyl chloride. And so because it's such a big, you know, uh, moiety here, it's just easier to abbreviate it as OTS instead. So we're going to show the mechanism here. And once again, there's pyridine. So first this starts off with our alcohol doing nucleophilic attack on sulfur kicks pi electrons up to one of the oxygens. And this is a pain in the butt to draw out, which is, again, why we often abbreviate this. So 
it leaves you with this lovely intermediate, and this may look funky, and once again, Sulphur's on the third order of the periodic table, is allowed to go over the octet rule. He's been violating the octet rule from the beginning here, so no, no big surprise here. But these pi electrons we pushed up to oxygen, they actually come right back down, causing chlorine to leave. Cool, that takes us right here. We also got a chloride that took off. All right, from here then, that's where pyridine's gonna get involved and deprotonate the H from the original alcohol, just like we've seen in with PBR3 and SOCl2. Lost a methyl group there, adding it back in. All right, so in this case, it is this big group right here that's referred to as OTS. And OTS is a phenomenal leaving group. So again, the hydroxyl group by itself, horrible leaving group. So, but OTS on the other hand, if this were to leave, you'd have a negative charge on oxygen that would be resonance stabilized between three different oxygens. And so a great leaving group. In fact, this is the best leaving group you've seen up till now. And uh, if you've been following along with my course, we saw this back in the substitution chapter and I alluded to it. It's even better than iodide. So better than iodide bromide or chloride is this OTS group, the sulfonate ester. And again, it's got the retained configuration because this carbon oxygen bond has never been broken all along the way. And so this is important. If we use SOCl2 or PBr3, we turn the hydroxyl group into an alkyl halide, which is a good leaving group, but with inverted configuration. So whereas if I use the sulfonate ester here, I turn my OH into a different good leaving group, but with the retained configuration. And because I can turn it, you know, the OH into a good leaving group, whether it be a halide or an OTS, either with retained or inverted configuration, there's some relevance when it comes to organic synthesis. And I will allude back to this at the, in the last lesson of this chapter. Now, if you've found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the most helpful things you can do to help me promote the channel. If you are looking for practice problems or the study guide or practice final exams, things of this sort, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.